Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, next session of our uh, WE conference. Uh, I'm happy uh, to uh, be here on this beautiful day uh, with nice weather in Gothenburg. But it's also a special day today, because uh, today it's Canada Day. And I'm not sure if there's any Canadians in the room, but uh, happy Canada Day to you. <laughs> And also, not to forget, it's also uh, today's Creative Ice Cream Flavor Day. Also very important to recognize. And of course, the start of the second half of the year. So half of the year already gone, but uh, now it's the second half. And um, I also know today uh, we've uh, had an extra second to uh, get our clocks back on the rotation of the Earth time. So uh, there's no need to feel rushed today because it's extra long day, we have an extra second to do all sorts of things that we always wanted to do. Well, I'm here uh, and it's my privilege to introduce uh, the next speaker. Uh, she is an, um, uh, a pedagogue and an uh, education an educational um, trainer. She taught groups of all uh, ages and uh, she works now at Hedmark University College in, uh, in Norway. I met her actually five years ago through uh, the Network of Pearl, which is the Partnership on Education and Research for Responsible Living. And um, she, she um, uh, hosts this network and she is the founder and leader and also the inspiration of this network. A very, very vibrant network with partners all over Europe, also in three branches uh, all over other continents. And she also holds a UNESCO chair on Education for Responsible Living. Uh, I think she actually is personally responsible to introduce the topic of uh, sustainable consumption of responsible living into the, the EE and ESD world and, uh, and bringing these two uh, networks together, which, uh, which is all often very difficult because it's set networks, but we are here for a common task. So um, there's multidisciplinary challenges ahead of us and we need all round um, professionals who know everything actually. So what I'm hoping to learn uh, this next hour from this talk is a new piece of the puzzle to help us solve uh, what also in the title of this conference, uh, People and Planet, How Can They Develop Together? And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Victoria Torrens, uh, who will uh, try and help us uh, getting this puzzle one, one step further in the next hour. I hope you enjoy her, her talk. Okay. Good morning or good afternoon, whichever you like. It's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to have a chance to talk with you about, among other things, sustainable lifestyles. <clears throat> and the question is, what does that have to do with environmental education and sustainability, and how and why should we move into higher gear about all of this. I thought I'd start by talking about rhinoceroses. I don't know how many of you are acquainted with rhinoceroses, uh, but do, you do know that they are threatened by extinction, right? They, they, are, they have a rough life ahead of them. Uh, but did you know that rhinoceros' horn is now one unit of weight of rhinoceros' horn brings as much money as one unit of weight of gold, of diamonds, and even of cocaine? Poaching is bigger business than it ever was before. F flat screen TVs. Anybody got one at home? <laughs> right. I hope you didn't kill anyone to get them. Because in, already in 2008, a Walmart employee by the name of Dijon Ramon was trampled to death by a crowd of crazed consumers who wanted to get in at 5 a.m. in the morning to get their discounted $750 flat screen TV. And he's not the only one who has died at the hands of crazy consumers, or the feet. Uh, but I thought I'd give us one more fact here. You recognize this, China. 
do you know that China has now uh, in, has started a regulation that says if you want to be promoted in your job, you also have to prove that you have been environmentally uh, responsible? People are going to be audited. A lot of people are going to be audited on their environmental performance in the future. Interesting thought. Hmm? The reason I bring all these small, different facts together to start our discussion today is because they point at the same thing. And we've talked about it since we came here in the beginning of the conference, and that is that we need to have change. We know that. Change is essential, it's necessary, but what is different than perhaps some of what has been said so far is that I claim we need change that is deep, that is extensive, that is significant, that's over the tipping point. It's not just incremental change. And the question is, how do we get there? And what can we do to achieve that? Well, if we look at who's responsible, you've heard this going on for years, right? We started out a number of years back by pointing the finger at the capitalist, the greedy, terrible, amoral capitalist, the businesses and their sidekicks, media, advertisers. They were the one who were destroying the world, right? Then the capitalists and others were saying, oh, no, 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 it's the governments. The governments, they haven't put the regulations in place. They don't take uh, the responsibility for the use of the natural resources, for waste disposal, for the responsible uh, so, uh, supply chains, etc. And then we came into a phase where everything was the responsibility of the consumers, right? The consumers were the cause of the disaster and also the potential saviors. But we know that research has shown that the responsibility lies on all our shoulders and the solution is in all of our hands together. And the interesting thing is then that while we know that, we can also see that we still have increased imbalances in distribution, in use of natural resources, etc. So the problem hasn't changed, and why not? What is it that we, that we need to do? How can we deal with this? I believe that we can deal with these things by answering a call that many, many international organizations thinkers around the world and researchers have been making. And this call is to look at the, the core, the source of what motivates and drives change. What is it that actually makes people have different ways of living, different behavior, whether they be people who run businesses or people who govern or people who go into the shop and buy a bar of chocolate? So if you'll let me take a few minutes to move into a discussion about the basic principles upon which values that direct change are based. It might lead us into an understanding of how we can actually put this inside, these ideas into uh, action in our work as teachers. No matter what lens you want to look through, whether you want to look through the lens of quantum physics, ecology, psychology, sociology, whatever. You'll find that these three, three principles I'm going to mention are recognizable. You'll see that they're there. The first one is connectivity and cohesion. This holds the atom together. There is a power of attraction. And if this power of attraction that makes plants distinguished as plants, that makes animals to be animals rather than plants, that brings cultures and societies together rather than having them kill each other off. This force, if it doesn't exist, then we have degeneration, then things collapse. I'll tell more about how these are manifested in society today in a minute. Transference and transmutation, big words, nice words, but when you look at them very carefully, they refer to the constant evolution, the constant adaptation, and the mutations that exist in the physical world as well as in the social world. 
And I'll come back again to how this manifests itself in our modern society today, because it's different than it was in the past. Then you have finiteness. Not a new idea, right? We've all known we're going to die. The, the dilemma of the commons is an old one. We've had that one around for ages. But understanding and acknowledging what finiteness means in terms of natural resources, social needs, etc., means that we can manage our resources and our human capacity in a different way today than we did in the past. Let's look at cohesion and connectedness. There are many scientists today that say because of the transition, the, the increased technology, the telecommunications, the, the fact that globalization has taken over to such an extent that the whole idea of empathy has evolved and grown. That this is a new age, an empathic age, and that this means something in terms of how we act. I'll come back to that in a minute in more detail. Then there is the question of transference and transmutation. If we look at that in a social context, what we're talking about is what audience started the conference with, what some of the others have spoken about, and this is social learning. But it's talking about collective social learning, and more on that in a minute. Then you have finiteness, and many people will say that, okay, we know that if we're going to succeed in, in living around the commons, the pool, the fishing pond, whatever, that we have to be able to share. But this idea of moderation and sharing has gotten root, and there's a groundswell happening around the world that some of us have been talking about earlier during the conference, but that I want to point out more details about in a minute so that we can really go home and say, hey, Maybe there are things happening that we can build on, that we can upscale, that we can increase, that are positive actions in new directions and not just incremental superficial changes. Okay, let's look a minute more deeply at empathy. You remember Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the guy out in the forest? He claimed that empathy is a natural feeling that counterbalances the violence of self-love and that maintains the ability for collaboration and cooperation among people. You may agree on that, you may not, but it's clear that without empathy, then we wouldn't care what happens. The consequences of our actions as individuals, our lifestyles, doesn't matter, you know, I mean, let the, let the people eat cake, that's fine. It doesn't matter, but it did matter. Marie Antoinette lost her head over it. So it is an issue here about how empathy has grown and how we are today. Are there any of you who went home and turned on the TV and surfed last night after the conference was over? I bet that most of you came across a channel that showed a story about some of the immigrants coming across the Mediterranean. Right? I did. I, I saw on several of the channels, the Swedish channel, the Norwegian channel, the BBC channel, they were all giving interviews about the poor people who came from Syria, from Eritrea, and all the things that had happened. I was listening to them talk about their children and their grandmothers that they'd lost in the transit and what had happened and the wife that got drowned. We used to be able to hear and the t sighs and see the tears of our family. Our family has now expanded. It's the people who we don't even know. In terms of the question of adaptation and collective social learning, it's obvious that social learning has been uh, defined by Vygotsky and by Banduri and others as a, a process that is a contextual reciprocity between individuals. But we're talking here about collective learning, about insights and understandings of alternatives that come on a much broader scale. And, you know, 
Everyone here, the fact that you're here today is an example of that, right? Otherwise, you'd be sitting in your office or your uh, school alone. But it's the fact that we realize that we can learn from each other and build on that and recognize that we have to identify alternatives, adapt them, use them, reflect on them, and act again. This cycle that almost each of the presenters so far have mentioned is essential. And it's interesting to note that already in the beginning of, of 2000, organizations like the International Standards Organizations started creating models to make it easier for businesses and governments and organizations to work with stakeholders. You know, so it's not just something that a few people have been thinking about. This collective learning process has taken systematic forms around the globe. And then the moderation and sharing. That's the fun part. I find it exciting uh, to think about what actually is happening that I constantly am seeing everywhere I go around the world. At the same time, if you read the news and you hear all the horrible stories about how we are being encouraged to continue and have more excess and luxury in our lives and how we are encouraged, it's an individual right to consume and you have to consume more or the everything will dissolve. I had a meeting the other day with a cabinet member in Norway who's responsible for consumption and consumer affairs. And we had heads of the banks, we had uh, Red Cross, we had all kinds of organizations sitting around the table discussing the problem of over-indebtedness. This is Norway, right? Over-indebtedness. And everyone was shaking their head. Oh, this is terrible. It's not just the young people, it's the older people too. Everybody is just, just on the verge of, of being buried under their debt. They can't pay, and what if? Well, I did the terrible thing of raising my hand and saying, well, what if we tried to teach people not to live on loans? And everybody went silent, and they looked at me like I had cursed in church. The, the modern financial system is built on loans, but there is a limit to how much one needs to, to borrow, right? That you don't need to borrow beyond your ability to pay back. You don't need to live above your means. But this is something which is still being debated and discussed. But in terms of the positive examples of moderation and sharing that are growing around the world, I just point out that you have three major areas, and more, but to categorize it generally. You have reflective consumption, you have collaborative consumption, and then you have the sufficiency movement. And I'm sure a lot of you know about all of these. But if you think of the reflective consumption, this is where people then think about the consequences of their daily choices. When you walk in the shop and you're gonna buy a chocolate or you're gonna buy an extra dress or whatever, most of you do this, right? You think of recycling, reusage, all of that. But to have this as a mindset where people identify and reflect on the symbolic value of their choices, on the values and about the future, is a part of what reflective, reflective consumption is all about. Then you have the idea of community consultation and co-creation of consumption, where people are growing community gardens, as we heard about yesterday, or other such things. You have collaborative consumption where people have realized that ownership is not the, the most important thing, where sharing is perhaps a, a, a paradigm, a lifestyle paradigm that's more valuable. And that's everywhere. It's not just the bicycles out on the streets of Gothenburg. You find this all around the world, and they're growing. These conclaves of people who are finding out that there are other ways of consuming than we are, nor we are used to. And then you have the Bhutan and Thailand examples of sufficiency, the idea of voluntary sharing, and that we need to maybe set limits to not only growth in terms of economy in general, but also individual personal needs especially in light of the fact that the majority of people in the world still don't have their basic needs covered. So, you know, the point of all this is that in the, looking at the basic principles of cohesiveness and, co and connectivity, 
of transmutation and transfer and of finiteness, you find their manifestations in empathy, in social learning, and in this idea of moderation and sharing. But what does it mean to us as teachers, right? Magdalene explained, I've been teaching all my life, and we are teachers. What does it mean? What does this groundswell, this fact that these positive things are happening, how can it become the main scale? What's going on? Well, the international community has actually been working on this for a long time. You've heard of the new definitions of consumption and production, and concepts like dematerialization and decoupling that have come up. It's not new. It's been going on for a long time. I'm not going to do as I usually do and ask how many people here have read the latest Human Development Report. If you don't know what the Human Development Report is, go home. <laughs> but in the 2014 Human Development Report, they actually went two steps further, building on this idea that empathy and collective learning have led the, the international community further in its human development than it was before. They emphasized the fact that the time is ripe for universal basic social services for everybody, everywhere, and that it's the responsibility of all of us to make sure that happens and the international community as well as the concept of minimum wage for everyone in the world. You know, you can ask yourself, why do these concepts come up? Why do these calls and appeals for these kinds of things come now as loudly as they do? And I would say that it's based on one thing. And those of you who are biologists know, what is it that makes us different from animals? Huh? What is it that makes us different from animals? What distinguishes human beings from homo sapiens, from, from the rest of the crowd? It's the ability to, plan, to envision and plan for the future. Consciously. You have instinctive things that animals do, but there's no animal on the planet that consciously creates, envisions, and plans for the future. And that's what is so important. A colleague here said the other day, hope determines the boundaries of our action. The boundaries of our hope determine the boundaries of our action. We need to know that we have agency, that we have influence. You know, mental health is based on the fact that people have control over their own lives. And globally, we have the same problem. If we go in there, and only focus on the negative things that are happening and have doomsday education for our students, they're going to be pacified. They're going to be depressed. There's lots of research on risk uh, description and, and knowledge about the problems in the world where they find that people sort of stop and say, uh-uh, there's nothing I can do. It's, it's too late. It's, it's, it's a problematic. I, uh, and then there's the problem of how to deal with the information overload. If you could just imagine the number of people I meet who say, oh yes, I used to be so concerned about my lifestyle and about my consumption patterns, but I just have given up. Because, you know, the scientists, they keep telling us different things all the time. And I usually bring out the tomato. You've heard the tomato story? Again, I bring you back to Norway. This is my point of reference. In Norway, <coughs> in the beginning of the century, everyone was talking about local grown food, right? This was important. You don't want to use a lot of, uh, get a lot of CO2 by transporting your food from far away. Well, you know, where we live, similar, we're a little further north than Jotteborg, but um, it's cold. I had four meters of snow on my roof this year. I don't know how Lars did, but we were shoveling all the time. The trouble is, you don't grow tomatoes all year round in Norway, unless, unless you use a greenhouse and a lot, a lot of energy. So it turned out that for a while, people were saying, oh, we're only going to eat, you know, homegrown tomatoes until they discovered that actually the homegrown tomatoes in Norway used more energy and released more CO2 than the ones that were flown in from Spain or from Israel. So you see, people got confused. They didn't know how to handle this. So 
the idea of understanding and dealing with these problems is a part of, of being given the agency and the ability to, to control our own lifestyles. The interesting thing is, and I'm going back now to, to the international community leading us in terms of def new definitions and finding new frameworks that we can work from. The people are recognizing the importance of individual decisions. They're also recognizing the importance of consumption patterns, um, development in general. And I, I, I know some of you were in Rio at the Rio Plus 20 conference. Uh, I don't know if you left as depressed and disappointed as I was, but uh, there were a number of us who were not too happy at the results. But at the same time, we had good results. I mean, there were some things that came out of it. And one of it is the fact that they're looking now at development not only as an economic improvement on GNP, GNP in countries. Their development is defined, as you see here on this quote, as poverty eradication, changing unsustainable and promoting sustainable patterns of consumption and production protecting and managing the natural resource base of economic and social development. These are the overarching objectives of and essential requirements for sustainable development. We still have a long way to go before the development people and those of us in the sustainability world really know what that means. But it's a first step. We're getting there. And then you have new definitions of sustainable lifestyles. And it's interesting. Did you notice what the uh, call was when we first started the present, the dance here? What did people, what was, what was she saying that we had to do? We had to think about what it meant to be human. What is human nature? That's how we started the whole conference here. And sustainable lifestyles, as UNEP has defined them now, is about enabling efficient infrastructures, and it's about individual actions and choices but it means rethinking how we put our values into actions, how we organize our daily life, how we socialize, share, learn, and educate. In other words, rethinking the ways of living, how we buy and what we consume. And it means an earnest examination of our understanding of human nature and the cultural frameworks. This is a revolution, folks. This is a turnabout of our heads. It's an upside down, it's a, it's a change, an emotional and intellectual new direction that we have to go in. And how do we do it? Well, we've gotten frameworks, right? We have the Sustainable Development Goals. I haven't got the time to talk more about them, but we've, they've been mentioned several times, and you really should go in and get involved. I keep telling people, did you know that each one of you could have put your say-so on the text of the SDGs? Just like some of us were involved in the open process on the text for the Rio Plus 20, the SDGs have had an open process for everybody in the world. You could have been involved, and you still can be involved in the way they are formulated, but they're pretty much at the point where they're gonna be decided on definitely in September. We have the Global Action Plan. You heard it described yesterday. There'll be a program after um, uh, there are other seminars here about the Global Action Plan. And then there's the 10-year framework of programs. And I encourage those of you who are curious about that to come to the symposium, which will be after this presentation. The 10-year framework of programs looks specifically at sustainable consumption and production. And in doing so, there's one program that is about lifestyles and education. So you see that the idea of sustainable lifestyles as a new paradigm, it comes through in all of these frameworks that have been uh, developed by the international community. And the interesting thing is, this is from the, the first draft of the Sustainable Development Goals by, by the Secretary General. He's tried to show them in an integrated way because people are seeing that we cannot just take one bit without the other. And it's interesting to note that he includes dignity and prosperity in the same breath as main goals of the SDGs. And as educators, how many of you have read Rethinking Education? Oof. Well, this is the 
latest follow-up on learning the treasure within. And I won't ask how many of you have read that, because if you haven't, I would almost say you should walk out of the room. It's terrible. That's the Bible, right? It's, you, you know what it, it contains. It's the, 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 the guidelines that have been leading education for years now. But this Rethinking Education is an updating on that and very worth reading and looking at. It can be found on UNESCO's website. Before I finish, I'd like to bring Sherlock Holmes into the picture. Do you know Sherlock Holmes? Yeah. He's considered the modern uh, icon for uh, the ultimate observer and rational problem solver, right? How many of you know the story of Silver Blaze, the racehorse? You know, Silver Blaze was uh, this fabulously fancy racehorse sitting in the standing, sleeping in this stall and it got stolen one night. And uh, the inspector comes along and he's very proud. He says, oh, talks to Sherlock and says, oh, I, I caught the thief. This stranger, this, this guy who was out wandering on the streets, he must be the thief. And Sherlock Holmes sits there with his pipe and says, oh, I'm very sorry, inspector. You're wrong. The inspector looks at him and says, what? What do you mean? How am I wrong? And Sherlock Holmes says, it's all about the dog. And uh, the inspector says, excuse me, the dog? Yes, you know, there was a dog in the stall sleeping, right? Yes, there's always a dog in the stall. It's a watchdog, right? Yes, yes, it's a watchdog, it's a watchdog. Well, did it bark when the horse was stolen? No, said the inspector. Well, that goes to show. It can't have been a stranger. It must have been someone the dog knew because the dog did not wake up. And the point was that the dog in the night incident is about what we don't see, what we have forgotten, what we have ignored, what we don't realize should be included. So this has become a kind of a metaphor for, for looking for what we don't recognize. I mean, the inspector, he only saw that a horse was stolen and there was a stranger on the street, must be connected. Sherlock Holmes put the whole story together and noticed the dog had slept silently. So what I suggest is we take this dog and we let him help us look at how we uh, teach or learn I don't like the word teach anymore, but we have to do it. That's we're teachers, right? But how we learn together about sustainable lifestyles. So I'm going to present very briefly some points about sustainable education for sustainable lifestyles and ask you to think in the way of Sherlock Holmes, looking for the dog in the night to see if there's any points on this that you don't teach or you don't bring into your educational processes. There may be others we should include, but this is sort of the basic ones that have been developed over the last 10 years, among other things, in connection with the Swedish Marrakesh Task Force on Sustainable Lifestyles, which Sweden has led. Let's start with this. Do you teach about or learn about stimulating the transformation of both our inner lives and our external conditions, or do we just look at the outside and the physical world? Do we talk about and teach about becoming more fully human and achieving a dynamic coherence between material and non-material requirements in life? I mean, this is, what, this is what happened when the Human Development Report recognized something strange. About 1994, 95, they suddenly noticed that the countries that were getting further and further ahead economically did not necessarily have improvements on social uh, levels, whereas some of the countries that remained perhaps slower in their economic growth, many of them had made great strides forward in terms of their social benefits and their other kinds of uh, development. And then they realized that material and non-material development in life has to be looked at in a different way. Do we, in our teaching and in our learning, do as I've tried to show today, 
examine and try to discover the underlying principles and values connected to the various dilemmas that we're talking about, connected to lifestyles, personal choice making? Do we acquire an understanding of the systems and processes connected to our lifestyles? I mean, w one thing is to understand life cycle analysis of a product, but another thing is to understand the social consequences of it. I mean, take the mobile phone, for example. Have you, do you teach about mobile phones in your classes? I mean, do you teach not only about what that does in terms of connecting people, what it does in terms of pollution when they throw away the old phones and dump them in piles in Asia and China and Africa? Or do you also talk about the symbolic value of mobile phones, the need to communicate, the need to connect, the need to be able to know what's going on? That also relates to the next gaining insights into interconnections, understanding as much as possible about the short-term and the long-term consequences of our choices. And there I have to admit, some of my students and people I meet around the world, they say, oh, when I buy a chocolate, I just want to have the chocolate. I don't want to know what happens to it when I, when it, when I throw it, part of it away, and I don't want to think about where it came from and who picked the beans and all. But there must be ways that we can share these insights without making people have to spend half their life analyzing what's inside of a Mac burger or what we do when we you know, choose to do one thing or the other. Then we have the, what I consider one of the biggest problems, and this is a, back again to the tomato story. It's this recognizing that our understanding changes and grows that what we once thought was right may not always be so. And that's really hard because people believe truth is truth, fact is fact, but it's not, it's relative. You know, we understand more fully something and that may mean that how we understood it before looks like it's being turned on its head. And then there's this that a lot of people say, oh, sorry a lot of people say uh, is, is completely irrelevant, and that's developing trust and compassion and inspiring the capacity for service. But if we are going to have lifestyles which guarantee that it's not only for an exclusive group of privileged people, one place, who green their lives at the expense of others on the globe, then we're going to have to build up more trust and not and more compassion and show this in practical application. And it may mean that we have to teach people about service rather than achievement, gain, getting on top, being the biggest guy in the company. And then to connect to much of what was said earlier in the conference, this idea of fostering a vibrant community. And where's your community? I mean, if you think about it, if you all go home and think about what is your community and how can you make that more vibrant and make it so you could help each other to develop lifestyles which are more sustainable because we can't do it alone. And how can we make that the purpose of our community? Again, something that we can't give answers to, but we can help our learners learn with us about how to achieve that. And finally, the question of global citizenship. And you will note when you look at the sustainable development goals, one, that education flows through the whole thing. Two, that sustainable development goal number four is specifically about education. But under that, you have an emphasis on various types of education. And this is where the lifestyle paradigm is emphasized explicitly, word for word and where this is all presented in terms of global citizenship. But when we teach global citizenship, again, it's the dog talking, do we not only look at personally responsible citizenship, you know, how I live my life, am I a good citizen, do I do what I'm expected to do, or do we just teach about participatory citizenship? You know, I vote and I interact with other people decently and I respect you and all that. Or do we teach a kind of transformative citizenship which leads to what I would call compassionate connectedness based on empathy, collective social learning, moderation, and sharing? 
by at the same time, not losing the ability to share and be happy. I love this quote, and I'd like to end with it. We cannot segregate the human heart from the environment outside and say that once one of these is reformed, everything will be improved. Man is organic with the world, and his inner life molds the environment and is itself deeply affected by it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victoria. Yeah. Um, well, quite some talk to, uh, to get into, right? Um, are there any questions or maybe uh, somebody in the audience wants to share uh, what their experience are about this topic of creating empathy, teaching moderation, teaching listen to your heart? Is there somebody who wants to make a comment or a question? I see someone in the back. Hello, uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm a student at Uppsala University, and I am really intrigued by the concept of global citizenship that you mentioned at the end. And I'm, I'm also involved in uh, creating a global citizenship program at Uppsala. And that's why I want to ask you a little bit more about what you mean by transformative citizenship. Can you, can you give us a little bit more insight what that could mean and how we can um, emphasize this in education? Yeah, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the global uh, reports and research done on uh, citizenship education, civic training. It's interesting to see that while they take into consideration um, aspects of uh, citizenship which go beyond voting and participating in the governance, uh, that's basically what it's focused on. Do the students know their rights? It doesn't emphasize so much do they know their responsibilities. Do they participate in uh, elections, in their student councils and things like that? Here, it's a whole different level of awareness and involvement. You know, to be honest, I, I'm, I've been around for a while, and we were talk, teaching a lot and talking a lot about citizenship and involvement and participation, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And then came the Arab Spring. And I've never been more disappointed and disillusioned in my life. Because the sad thing about that, and perhaps you can go back to the 68, you know, some of us were around even then, and, and, and the same thing happened there, that that you had a lot of enthusiasm, you had a lot of involvement, you had a lot of lives killed in the Arab Spring, but what were the concrete, constructive results? Because citizenship, if it's transformative, is not only about protesting and disagreeing, it's about helping to build alternatives. So that, in that terms, it's transformative in that it changes the way things happen. And I would say participating in processes like the SDGs and in local processes that make your communities more vibrant, more involved in sustainability and trying to change and modify things is the key. But it, it's a difficult thing and, and you know, it's been a no-no for so many years. You don't talk about global citizenship. And now it's something that we need to build and develop and consider more about. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks, there's a question here in the front. It's not a question. Oh, it's it is a small question. comment. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Victoria, for this excellent, uh, great presentation. Um, allow me just to comment on one of the starting points. I think in our let me say, we may have Sherlock Holmes wrong because sometimes the dog is sleeping. He's sleeping now. And he's sleeping because together with the empathy, we have the apathy. 
And actually, through the TV, you just gave an excellent example. We have cult cultivated a superficial emotional link with a vision that we forget with the next cup of tea. And this is one of a wrong starting points because I believe all what you said is about keeping the dog actually, al not allowing it to sleep enough. So this is, uh, so please don't start with as empathy, as empathy is being something we have achieved. It is only to a very small, actually, percentage in comparison with the apathy. And uh, this is just uh, for the starting point, and again, for the social learning, we have something similar as well. We have to make a distinction between the superficial phenomena and the actual impact. I think we share the same views, and the symbols of success have to play a role, mm -hmm. more than actually the models or the visions of the short-term emotional stimuli. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for saying that, Mike. It's completely true. I agree completely. I think perhaps uh, the reason I focused on the positive and the small growing is because we often overlook that and go home depressed about all that we haven't achieved. The apathy that reigns, the disaster, the, the sadness, the, 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 the lack, and we have to become more active. I mean, moving into higher gear is about us going home and not being calm, quiet, and content. It's about us actually being motivated and inspired to really doing more than we would have done. And you know, I, I'm married to a fellow who does a lot. He, he, give, you know, he gives himself out to people, to, to movements, to activities, 150%. And at one point in our lives, I was involved in something and I went up to him and I said, oh, look at this. And I had written a paper that said, increase your involvement by 100%. And he looked at me and he said, oh no, I'm already doing some, I can't, you know. And many of us feel that we're doing our ultimate, our optimate, but that's not good enough. And we have to involve those who are not yet there to be involved and giving a little more. Maybe if we all gave 20% more, we'd get a lot further. So, so yes, oh, I agree completely, but we are moving and we just have to get moving faster and more intensely, and maybe in a lot of new directions. We don't know, that's what we learn along the way. So, absolutely. There's a question here in front. Uh, thank you, Victoria, for a very inspiring presentation. I love it very much. Uh, so my name is Huyen. I come from Vietnam. I work on environmental education for more than like, 15 years. And I came here with a wonder. Uh, it's not really related to our presentation, but maybe I want to ask every participant here, uh, because uh, I'm very happy to meet all of you. 700 people who are caring about the Earth, who are talking about teaching people, changing people to fit into this planet. But I know that there are other group of people who are top scientists who are talking about changing, modifying our Earth to feed the human being. I'm talking about geoengineering. I don't know if you guys have heard about that. So I don't know how we should address it into environmental education. Should we avoid, should we avoid talking about it? Because if we talk so much about geoengineering in environmental education, people may think that okay, we can do anything without us, and then some guy will be there to clean it up, to fix it for us. So how can we uh, address it in the environmental education? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, that? Oh, yeah. yeah, that was a, a very good question, a very good comment, thank you. I had a slide I wanted to share with you. It's a, a picture of a guy hanging off a cliff with one hand. He's about to fall down into the abyss. And there's another fellow standing over, looking down, saying, Oh, you know, poor guy, technology will save you. And um, <clears throat> this is what a lot of people say about the 
geotechnical, the biotechnical revolution that's going to save us. Uh, technology has saved us from many things. It's also caused a large number of problems that were unexpected in, as consequences of that. Uh, the Green Revolution has been a savior for many lives, but at the same time has its negative effects. I feel personally that we need to encourage open discussion and criticism about things. And I have this quite personally in my own university. My office is here and right beside it is the Biotechnical Institute. <laughs> and we're constantly being told we have to collaborate. Well, we do have a lot of conversations and we have a lot of, co of uh, communication. But I am not going to go over there and wave the flag for GMOs because personally, I'm not convinced that GMOs have been researched enough, that there is enough data on the consequences, etc. But, you know, there are many aspects to those questions. And I feel that what we're lacking and, and we need to do is to develop an ability for critical analysis in our students and in our friends and in our neighbors that doesn't make us take everything at face value. I mean, is it really that we absolutely have to have gene-modified food in order to survive everywhere? And what does that mean? And does everything have to be that? Do we absolutely need to have this kind of, of alternative energy? You know, it's not to stop things. It's to make the, the, the debate broader and more uh, honest, more frank. Uh, and if we learn to do that without becoming defensive, without saying, ah, you're trying to starve people who will never get food in the world, then we have an ability to move forward. And I think this is what's lacking, and it, it probably has a lot to do with the business world. Because if the business world says that we want to uh, gain a profit from something, they're not going to be very open to hear the criticisms about what will give them profit. And I, I was involved in the ISO 26000 social responsibility standard preparation. And there was one of the interesting things that the businesses involved in that creation of that standard, they protested at first by the fact that we were saying you can't just listen to stakeholders, you also have to respond to them and say what you've done and why you've done that. But after a while they seemed to realize that it's not just a question of being a nice guy saying, oh yes, what did you say? Yes, yes, I'm listening very nicely and then going and doing what they want to do. But it is an interaction. It's an interface where you have some change that happens. So we have a big task ahead of us being open. I think journalism, I think the media has a very big task. Uh, I think people who dare, like Naomi Klein, to ask questions, uh, at the cause of being considered a whistleblower or being killed or whatever, need to be made secure in the fact that their questioning is for the better good and that we work on that. But critical thinking is not necessarily given high priority on rating of schools. So maybe we need to get it in there too <laughs> so that we can be justified in teaching it. Thanks. We have time for one last question or command, comment if somebody has a burning remark to make. Or Everyone agrees. Yeah. Yeah. We can go. Uh, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> I don't there's, believe there's that. One there. Is there one there? Yeah. Super. Buenos días. ¿Puedo hacer la pregunta en español? <gasps> we don't have no. earphones. No. <laughs> can you do it in English? No. Uh, can someone, uh, we, I don't have the, yes, we're having a, tra oh, <laughs> our translator, thank you, sir, I apologize that we did. Do you have a mic for him? Sorry, I apologize, I didn't bring the earphones, my fault. Okay. Here, yeah, you come here. Like uh, okay. translation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, please. Usted dijo algo muy lindo acerca de la esperanza determina los límites de nuestras acciones para el futuro. ¿Me puedes repetir? Porque no, no se escucha muy okay. bien desde aquí con los parlantes. Usted dijo algo muy hermoso sobre la esperanza determina los límites de nuestras acciones 
para el futuro. Beautiful, very nice regarding that hope determines the limits of our wishes. Okay. Nosotros estamos aquí we? porque tenemos esa esperanza. We share this hope. Estamos convencidas And we are fully convinced que debemos repensar el papel de la escuela. That we should rethink the role the school is playing in our lives. Es ahí donde está la esperanza. Because we live We believe that the quid of a question is there. Hope lies within the school. Debemos formar hábitos de vida saludable y sostenible. We should try to niños. develop sustainable cities. Pero nosotros estamos prácticamente solos. But we are working alone. Necesitamos del mundo. We need the world to jump in. Que nos apoye. We need the world in this endeavor. Y lamentablemente estos eventos son muy but, selectivos. But unfortunately, this type of events are very selective. Necesitamos esa voz que se escuche en todo el mundo. We need that our voice should be listened in all over the world. Nuestros países tienen muchas necesidades. Our countries have a lots of needs. Y se están destruyendo las reservas naturales. And natural resources are being destroyed. Tenemos mucha riqueza We have a de la gente. Wealth, and I'm talking about human capital. Pero queremos el apoyo, queremos que estas palabras lleguen But a, to, a nuestra gente. Para estar aquí nos costó muchísimo. It has been very hard for us to be able to travel to Sweden to be participating in this conference. Y de mi país solo pudimos venir tres personas. From my country, only three people could travel to Sweden to participate in this meeting. Es importante que nos den oportunidad And para que podamos compartir en estos eventos. Important to be offered opportunities so we can share this type of event. Y compartimos totalmente esa lucha que tenemos para formar a los niños, para mejorar la escuela. With this endeavor, and as I mentioned before, we should integrate schools in all this process. Solo quería hacer esa reflexión. This was just a comment and a reflection. Mm. Muchísimas gracias. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, he said, okay. Thank you very much for your comment. And I wish we had the time to, to go into more detail about how that can happen. Again, I encourage you to, uh, I hate to say this because I, 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 I'm an old fashioned person. I prefer looking in people's eyes and holding their hands and talking to them and sharing that way. But the internet is now the global communications platform for most of what's happening. And if you go on to the UNESCO sites and the UNEP sites, you will see that there is a, a lot more um, exchange of experiences, uh, even among countries that are far away from Sweden and, uh, and people who don't have the opportunity to come to events like this. Uh, the, the SCP Clearinghouse, that UNEP has put up is a very interesting uh, source of examples, best practices, ideas. Uh, UNESCO is now putting up a platform for the, the GAP program. Uh, on the other hand, I would also encourage you to, to uh, spread the word about things like the 10-year trust fund, which is a call for projects, particularly from the South, uh, from people who need the extra resources. I mean, to be honest, even coming here from Norway would have almost been too much for my pocketbook at a conference like this. So it is selective, but, but we need to build the networks. We need to, to share the experiences and learn from each other. And I've been doing, working with that for, for most of my, my career and see that it's not easy, but it has to be done, and it needs to be done preferably face-to-face -face by people moving 
but we have to give each other the opportunities, and money plays a role there. You do not have a conference where people come from Africa or from Latin America or from Asia. If we have it in the middle of Europe and it costs you know, a fortune at the hotel or just just getting here. So we need to consider these things and think of other ways of sharing and of working together. And maybe, maybe we all need to come, to, you know, to move south and, and, and open the doors and say, hey, let's make our networks work there, really, as many do. And as I know, there have been calls for participation and conferences and meetings which are not so expensive, not so far away. Uh, but, but it's difficult. So I think we have to, in the meanwhile, rely a little bit on, on our, inter, our telecommunications and all. But the point of what you're saying is completely true. And if we're going to upscale, uh, move into higher gear, uh, and, and mainstream what's going on, especially in schools, we have to be able to show what other people are doing in communities. We have to develop our communities, like you said. So I agree completely and hope we all take that to heart when we go home. Thank you so much. This is where we end. And wish you a good lunch. Thank you.